There's two things I really don't like. One is shopping and one is cooking. But now I've discovered HelloFresh. So if you're not sure what to cook for dinner, don't have time to do your weekly grocery shop, with HelloFresh you'll find the perfect, easy to cook meal delivered straight to the comfort of your own front door. HelloFresh are the world's leading fresh meal kit company and are on a mission to change the way people eat forever. Their boxes contain all the pre-portioned ingredients you will need to cook your meal, including sauces, seasonings and garnishes, along with a step-by-step -step recipe guide. And cooking the food typically takes no longer than 30 minutes. This means less preparation and less wasted food. HelloFresh makes eating healthier even easier, with many low-calorie, carb-smart, vegetarian and pescatarian options every week. Plus, every recipe is packed with fresh produce sourced directly from farmers. HelloFresh allows you to choose recipes from a weekly menu, so whether you're up for a Mexican cheesy chicken burger or a simple pub-styled shepherd's pie, you won't ever be disappointed. You can browse from over 2,500 of the best dinner recipes, all created by their expert chefs, pretty much guaranteed to please everyone, even the fussy eaters. What's more, HelloFresh is committed to making fresh, delicious food available now more than ever and has taken extra steps to keep its employees and customers safe. And of course, virtually all the packaging is recyclable, sustainable and environmentally friendly. So why not start exploring and spice up your cooking routine by integrating fresh and easy dinner ideas into your busy schedule? With nights out and trips to restaurants currently off the menu, HelloFresh gives you a great opportunity to flaunt your cooking skills and cook a meal for your loved ones. And with nationwide delivery and flexible subscription, what more can you ask for? I can honestly say that HelloFresh has become a big part of my life. So if you'd like to try it, go to HelloFresh.com and use my code BRIEFCASE10 to get 10 free meals, including free shipping. I've also left a link below. Today we are looking at a case from the early 19th century. So sit back as we go to Ireland. Ellen Hanley was born on the 19th of July 1803 in the small village of Brewery in the county of Limerick in Ireland. Brewery was a peaceful place located next to the River Maig and four miles northwest of the town of Kilmerlock. Like most people at the time, Ellen's parents worked on the land the majority of which was rented to tenants by landlords who owned large estates. The families who could not afford to rent any land would usually work as farm labourers. Although many crops were grown, the main one was potatoes. In 1815, the grain prices collapsed, which caused much depression and distress on both sides of the Irish Sea. Prices for livestock, however, were still relatively high so many farmers started to devote more of their land to pasture. Although this was good for them, pastoral farming required far less manual labour and the move was disastrous for the smallholders and labourers, causing much tension in the countryside between the poor tenant farmers and the wealthy landowners. When Ellen was six years old, her mother died. This was a very difficult time for her, especially when her father remarried and young Ellen was sent to live with her maternal uncle named John Conroy in the nearby town of Croom. She was very popular and well liked. She also had a charming and enduring nature, but also grew up to be a very beautiful young lady. Ellen was known locally as Anne Colleen Bourne or the Colleen Bourne, which literally translates to the white girl. Although English had become the first language of most people in Ireland by the early part of the 19th century, Irish was still widely spoken, especially in rural areas. Ellen's beauty attracted a lot of attention, and young men would often tip their hat to her. This was seen as a conventional gesture of politeness. It was unusual that a gentleman would do it to someone he did not know, especially to someone who was considered to be of a far lower social status. One gentleman, who seemed to have a very high regard for her, was named John Scanlan. 
He was part of the minor aristocracy and had previously served as an officer in the Navy. His family owned Balakahane Castle, which was less than a mile from Ellen's uncle's home. He would visit her whenever he was able, and it did not take long before the residents of Croom started to talk about the relationship. Some were concerned about the difference in the couple's ages and social backgrounds. He was in his 20s, the eldest son of distinguished landowning parents, while Ellen was still only 15 and the daughter of a tenant farmer from Brewery who had been brought up by her uncle. Nevertheless, she was a clever girl who was aware that becoming the wife of the eldest son of the owners of Balakahane Castle would undoubtedly enhance her social status. John's family tried to discourage the relationship. Although Ellen was a beautiful young lady, she was not from a high-class family and they thought that she may lack the social graces required to marry into the aristocracy. Despite his family's concerns, John proposed to Ellen. At first she seemed hesitant to accept. She was still young and did not want to upset her uncle. After all, he had been so good to her since the death of her mother. But John was very persuasive, and in June 1819, after receiving the small dowry that had been put aside for her, John Scanlon and Ellen Hanley eloped. Rumours soon started to circulate around Croom that they had married in secret, and it was presumed that this would have taken place in either the city of Limerick or the old church at Kilrush. They moved to a house owned by the Scanlon family in the small village of Glynn, situated on the south shore of the River Shannon, about 30 miles from Limerick. The romance, however, didn't last long, and just a few weeks after they married, John's sister, who was not aware that her brother had gone away to marry his teenage bride, wrote a letter informing him of a possible suitor, a well-educated and attractive young lady who was the daughter of a rich and prominent family. John, however, was already married, and in Ireland in 1819, it was not possible to obtain a divorce. John liked to gamble and soon started to work his way through Ellen's dowry. This greatly displeased her as she knew how hard her uncle had worked to save the money and her husband seemed to be very reckless with it. But what could she do as she was just a teenager, the daughter of a tenant farmer and he was a gentleman from a well-to-do family who had wealth and influence. In mid-July, John Scanlon told the gentleman that he employed as his assistant named Stephen Sullivan, to take Ellen on a boat trip on the River Shannon. John had known Stephen for some time, as John had been his commanding officer during their time in the Navy. It was a hot summer's day, and people very much liked to spend time relaxing on the river. This day, however, was a Wednesday, so the river would not be as busy as usual. At first, Ellen was reluctant to go, but after a while, she agreed. They were noticed by a few other people, who remembered a beautiful young lady in a boat on the river, accompanied by a gentleman. However, in the days and weeks that followed, Ellen was not seen. Her uncle did not receive news of her. A month passed, and still no one had heard anything. People started to wonder what had happened to Ellen Hanley. Nearly two months later, on the 6th of September 1819, the naked body of a young lady was found on the banks of the Shannon Estuary near Killerush. It was established that the deceased had been shot and the authorities believed that following her death, the culprit had removed her clothes and jewellery, tied her to a rock and threw her into the water. News of the discovery soon spread and the deceased was identified to be the teenage bride from Croom, Ellen Hanley. The people of the town were very upset to learn that their beautiful Colleen Bourne had been murdered and left in the river. And as well as feeling great sorrow, they also felt great anger. A rumour circulated that she had been killed on the 19th of July, which would have been her 16th birthday. And this only increased the sense of horror that had surrounded her death. John Scanlon immediately became the prime suspect. He had spent the previous two months drinking and gambling and seemed to have resumed his bachelor lifestyle. As the authorities investigated the case, a boatman informed them that he was certain that the piece of rope that was used to tie young Ellen's body to the rocks 
was the same one that he had lent John Scanlon and his employee Stephen Sullivan in July. He had noted that the pair had not returned it. Both men, however, were nowhere to be found. It was not until November in the same year that John Scanlon was discovered. He had been staying in the house of a friend. He was arrested and taken into custody. But where was Stephen Sullivan? No one knew, and there were rumours abound that he had fled to America. The local people demanded justice, and John Scanlon was charged with the murder of his wife, Ellen. His trial started at the courthouse in Limerick on the 11th of March, 1820, and was one of the most sensational of its day. As the defendant was from a wealthy family, he employed the best legal counsel available and was represented by Daniel O'Connell, a leading lawyer of the time. Many witnesses were called, although none of them could place John on the boat with Ellen. Nevertheless, he was found guilty and sentenced to hang. On the 16th of March, 1820, he was escorted to Gallows Green. The journey was about one mile, and en route, the carriage taking him had to cross a narrow bridge. However, all the horses stopped and refused to go on. Despite numerous attempts to get them to move, the horses just stood still. John Scanlon then had to get out of the carriage and walk to the gallows, where he was heckled by a jeering public before he was hanged. Four months later, in July 1820, Stephen Sullivan was arrested. He had not gone to America, instead he had been in hiding. He was tried in the same courthouse in Limerick and found guilty of murder. However, unlike John, in an attempt to repent for what he had done before his execution, Stephen confessed to his part in the horrible crime. He said that it was John Scanlon who had devised the plan to rid himself of his wife. Ellen was fond of taking boat trips on the River Shannon, and John had bought a small boat. The day before the murder, Stephen Sullivan had asked Ellen if she would like to take a boat trip on the river. At first she was hesitant, but she later agreed. Stephen Sullivan then boarded the boat with a loaded musket. However, as they slowly travelled on the water, he realised that he could not hurt the beautiful and charming young lady. So eventually, they returned to the shore. When John Scanlon saw the boat, he rushed to greet it. But when he realised that Ellen was still very much alive, he was very displeased and demanded that Stephen take her out again the next day and complete the horrible act. He sent Stephen to purchase some bread, butter and whiskey, and as they ate and drank, he told his wife that she should make the most of the long summer days and go out on the boat again in the morning. Ellen agreed, so the following day prepared herself for another trip along the river. When they were alone and enjoying the peaceful and tranquil surroundings, Stephen Sullivan took out his musket and shot the defenceless young lady. He then removed her clothes and jewellery and tied her to a heavy rock. When he was in the centre of the river, he pushed her off the boat and watched her sink to the bottom of the water. He said that he very much regretted his actions. A few days later, Stephen Sullivan was hanged. Ellen Hanley was buried in Bahrain Cemetery near Kilrush. On her grave it is written, Here lies the Colleen Bourne, murdered on the Shannon, July 14th, 1819. Rest in peace. The story of the beautiful young Irish girl has been made into films, plays, books and songs which has meant that the terrible circumstances in which she met her end have never been forgotten. It is presumed that the reason John Scanlon wanted to dispose of his wife was because he was unable to divorce her. However, no evidence of a marriage between John Scanlon and Ellen Hanley have ever been found. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. And I'd like to thank one more time HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. There is a link to the HelloFresh promotion below. Please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case. <laughs>